Welcome everyone. My name is Jack Fortin and I'm the curator and facilitator for this Winter Centered Life series. And we're in the second uh, installment of a, a four part series. And I wanna begin by a little bit of housekeeping. I wanna remind you of some of the virtual logistic details. Uh, first of all, today's meeting will be recorded and it'll be posted on the Augsburg YouTube channel at a later date. Secondly, we do have live captioner today, so please click the CC button at the bottom of your screen to enable the transcript. And finally, we have time after we hear from our speakers for some Q&A, so we want you to please enter your questions in the chat function uh, below. Uh, we will also take questions during the time of their presentations. Um, and I will, uh, although you will not have access to them, I will and I will break them in, break into their uh, presentation as for your questions to be addressed. So now I'd like to introduce our theme again for this series and, uh, and also introduce our speakers. Um, the theme for this series is our, her our historical heritage, interpreting and interrogating our sagas as we seek to live faithfully in the time being. Um, the impetus for this, as I said last week, was as we looked at the prolonged crisis and how individuals and communities and institutions are tending to look at this crisis from a very short term perspective. So many people in today's world are looking for relevant fixes instead of looking at our roots for guidance. Instead, we're making up our future based on the immediacy of the crisis. We know from the work of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and other theologians who lived through phenomenal crises as Dietrich did during World War II he reminded that the church at that time became irrelevant because they tried to be relevant and not go back to their roots so that they could understand their future from the posture and the shaping of what had gone before. And so one of the things that we want to do now is in this series is to look at a demonstration model of one organization, which is Augsburg University, who's attempted through a project, a multi-year project, to look at their own heritage and to try to draw from that heritage better understanding of why Augsburg University stayed in the city, why we do the things we do, and what has caused us to uh, be such a culturally diverse uh, educational system. We all have a heritage to draw on if we choose a family heritage as well as a faith heritage. We can gain inspiration and motivation to address our own moorings as we delve into the heritage of Augsburg. So we hope that this will not only be fascinating and interesting to hear a bit about this Lutheran University, but it also we hope would be a, aspiring you to reconsider your own heritage, your own roots as you seek a meaningful and sustainable historical future. We're again fortunate to have with us some very gifted faculty and staff to be the presenters through this series. Today, we are privileged to have uh, Terrence Kwame Ross, who's a professor of education, um, and Katie Bishop, who's an assistant provost at Augsburg University for student success. So welcome Terrence and Katie. And so I wanna begin uh, just by uh, talking a little bit about what you actually do. I mean, your title <laughs> says one thing and we both know, uh, all three of us know from being together, our titles don't begin to explain our contribution. And so if you could say just a word about that, and then also what has drawn you to this project. Um, each of you could speak to that, It'd be a way of getting ourselves going together 
uh, d during this conversation. All right, thank you so much, Jack, and um, um, welcome everybody. Um, I do teaching and learning. Um, so um, I'm in a teach education program. Uh, I teach um, pre-service teachers, and I also do workshops and consulting. Um, but just everyday life, um, I'm into this idea of teaching and learning. And what connected me to this project is just that um, idea of teaching and learning and how we all are teaching and learning and how uh, we can grow from our history. So the Saga Project gave me an opportunity to investigate and to look deeply at Augsburg roots and how it connects to uh, myself personally and professionally, but also how it connects to all of us too. Thank you, thank you, Terrence. Terrence and I go back a little ways while we have you on the <laughs> center stage here of time with Wilder Forest and we were doing some pretty uh, creative education with uh, urban and suburban schools. And uh, you played a very leading role there as one of our educators. Um, so that's how we first got to know one another. And do you recall that experience, Terrence? <laughs> oh, definitely, Jack. I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, that was great. And Katie, um, Tell us a little bit about what you actually do, because you're in a very unique role, I think, in a critical role mm -hmm. uh, as we forge our future. Uh, you, you you serve in a unique role, but also a very prophetic role, I, feel, I think. So can you say a little bit about that and then what drew you to this project? Sure. Thanks, Jack. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be with you this afternoon. Um, so I am the assistant provost for student success, and, and what that really at its heart means in my my day-to-day -day work is that um, I spend a lot of time examining the structure of the campus, so the policies, the practices, the language we use, and, and working with folks to actually rethink those things so that they work better for students. Mm -hmm. um, my, my job is to make sure that when we admit a student, that that student is able to graduate um, and earn an Augsburg degree. And, um, and so my work is really focused on when there are barriers for students and they encounter problems. Um, lots of times problems that we've unintentionally created. Um, lots of times systemic problems. Uh, my job is really focused on how to, how to solve those both in the short term for an individual student and then in the long term um, for all students. So um, it's, it's really interesting work um, and I, I love it, I love Augsburg. Um, you know, I was really drawn to this project um, when Paul invited me, in part because I'm the second generation of my family to actually work at Augsburg, and so I feel like Augsburg has been sort of part of my personal um, history for a very long time. Oh. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to steal something that another member of the project has talked about. Um, one of our librarians is on the project. His name is Stuart Van Cleve, and he has talked about the act of of interrogating and sharing history as an act of love. Um, and when he says that, it's I write it down every time because it feels like the most kind of profound thing that I, I sort of get to in this in this project is this idea that um, that sort of looking at and sharing our history is actually an act of love for the people from us to the people who came before us, and also an act of love for, to the people who will come after us because it really contextualizes a community and sort of um, contextualizes this idea that people have have worked hard for the next generation to be here and to be successful. Um, and I just, that really speaks to me in terms of the work that we do today and how it's going to um, move forward and impact people. Thanks so much, Katie. I think that gives people a little bit of context to both of you. And so now we'll turn it over to Terrence to lead us off today. Terrence, thank you again for being here and taking the time to share with us. All right. Second slide, please. All right. So um, what you see um, here is a picture of um, Old Main um, in terms of um, our um, our building. Um, what I want you to um, get a, a, a feel of is sort of Augsburg ideal of first. So as we think about Saga, Saga describes an organization, right? So organization is a, um, this, uh, this, uh, 
Clark describes an organization saga as a collective memory of a unique accomplishment by exploring, uh, exploring and using its own history as an artifact. Um, this approach to organization memory, when shared, should elicit and solicit strong bonds within and outside of the organization. Here, in this um, sampling research inquiry around FIRST, we start at the very beginning of Augsburg history, which um, predates Luther's 1517 actions of nailing his ninth five thesis to the door of Wittenberg Castle, um, Germany. After that, there's been a lot of firsts. Next slide, please. Um, um, there's been um, first seminary founded in Norwegian um, in terms of Lutherans in America, um, first president of Augsburg um, University. There's been a first uh, move from Wisconsin to uh, Minneapolis. Um, there's been a first name change, Augsburg Seminary to Augsburg College and um, Theological Seminary in 1917. There's been fir um, a first woman who were admitted as students in 1921. There was a first woman in formal leadership position in Augsburg, Gorda Mertensen, in 1923. There was a first Latinx uh, woman to serve as faculty at Augsburg, Mimi Kelsley, in 1948. Um, until her death in 1969. She was born uh, in Mexico. There was a first um, American um, Asian specific woman um, to serve as faculty, Ken Ken Jensen, from 1959 to 1954. Next slide, please. There was a first woman hired at Augsburg um, as faculty, Mary T. Howard. The first woman advisor, Vivian Jenkins Nelson, it was the first director of Pan-African Center, formerly known as the Black Student Affairs, Betsy Hedison. There was also a first American uh, Indian um, program director, Bonnie Wa Wallace. Next slide, please. It was a full-time director of Latino Student Services, Eloso uh, uh, Ejavaz, 1993. First non-Lutheran president, uh, me, I'm sorry, first non Norwegian president, 1997. First Nobel Prize winner at Augsburg, Peter Argri. And there was a first director of LGBTQI uh, student services, Jay Wisner. Sorry for not uh, putting the zero, but that was in 2004. Next slide, please. So these, this ideal of first, what does that mean? So we move away from this ideal of first as an um, accomplishment and look at first um, in a variety of ways, right? So this connects to me because I was the first African-American male in the education department who was tenured. So as a descendant of ex-enslaved Africans from the American slavery system, I have a particular interest and identifying histories and strategies for liberating self and others from situations occurring concerning error, abuse, and discrepancies, similar to Luther. There are key words such as escape, break away, turn away, rebellion, revolution, fighters, reformers, reform, all hold particular power and significance for oppressed groups as a collective and as an individual, all leading to some sort of change for the betterment of self, others, and the community. So what you see now is a hand of Luther, right? Luther actions were first like a way forward, a route, a return to that which is true and good, However, this turning away from the Roman Catholic Church and becoming Protestant, Protestant, Protestant wasn't without acrimony, conflict. It was a turning away from or going back to a type of tradition. All of this set up a dynamic history that in part gave birth to many, many histories as we will see. Next slide, please. Think about um, Luther, uh, uh, 1517 in that particular time. 
um, we can look at what was happening, um, um, sort of as they call it, the zeitgeist, right? It was this heat of the moment of breaking away from that which was not true. That happened again in 1968. Um, in terms of America. Um, what you see now is a one day in May. Um, but what was go this is in Augsburg, but what was going on um, nationally, right, uh, was also protest for civil rights. Um, so this is a student protest, one, uh, one day in May, on May 15, 1968, classes were canceled and Augsburg community was encouraged to participate. So once again, you can start to see as you focus down um, in Augsburg and focus out in terms of society and then focus out even broader in terms of America, um, world history, right back to Luther, you start to see this idea of the power of protest to bring voices uh, um, that are usually um, left out. Um, next slide, please. So um, the one day in May created um, demands from um, black students. And what, ha what came out of that one day in May was many things. One was demands, but also it was the birth of the black student affairs in 1968, then name changed to the Pan-African Student Union, PASU, in 1970. Next slide, please. Or, um, so what we wanna do now is um, who writes history? We write history. So what we really want to do right now is play for you a video um, of students um, who help write history at Augsburg, students and faculty. And we want to go back to that moment to listen and listen to their voice um, as they were making history to connect to this idea um, 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 of history roots and protests and what can come out of that. So here's the voices of students who return to Augsburg University reflecting on um, PASU in terms of what came out of the one day in May. People, people the times come. Oh, this is My name is Salma Sandy. It's Mohammed Slam. Magnus Kiguana. Michael Benham. It's Vivian Jenkins Nelson. All right. Rosina Fuller. And I graduated 2001. 97 graduate. 1969 to be the first advisor. And I'm a senior. I graduated in May 2008. 97. Director of the Pan African uh, Center. She's wearing a blue and white. Uh, well, initially I came to Augsburg for sports um, via basketball. I was initially attracted through sports, basketball, you know, Devin George and whatnot. Um, and I played baseball in high school too, so I kind of had the connection there. But once I got here, I saw that there was a lot more to um, expand on. Um, actually, I prayed about coming to Augsburg, and uh, this is the only school I applied to. I knew I was supposed to come to Augsburg. I was invited to Augsburg by Emanita Gay Hawthorne to come to the Raff and Ribs, and one of my best friends, Heather Barker, was at Augsburg, so I came and hung out on campus, and I really liked it. It was Lutheran. I'm Lutheran. I grew up on a Lutheran college campus, so it was like a second home to me. I also love the students that I worked with. Because it's an, an urban setting, it's a small campus, and they offered a lot of services that I needed. A bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a medical degree, a law degree, a PhD. PASU um, was it just a, a, a great thing to be a part of. I wasn't fully active in a lot of the things, but I got involved because of uh, my talents, my uh, design and art talents. Uh, my friend uh, Chad and Keith and, and all these friends I became friends with, you know, I just would come in the office and, uh, and Anita, Miss, you know, Miss Hawthorne, 
you know, she had an eye for, for picking out people's talents. She didn't care what color you were, what who you were. She just... Uh, Anita Gay Hawthorne, you know, she was amazing. Community, particularly a multicultural community, it's one of the things I really admired about Pasu. And Pasu bridged the divide in terms of African American and um, I would just say blacks from uh, all across the world connected us with the Pan-African Conference at Mankato, which connected us with um, minority students all across the, st the state and connected us with um, African American and African leaders from all over the world. Well, I think in many ways, um, having had the opportunity to work with the Pan-African Student Union since I came, um, the one thing I did notice is uh, that the Pan-African Student Union really was an extension of, of the director's position and an extension of the Pan-African Center. And so the ways in which I couldn't reach students given um, the large number of students that we have here uh, and the competing, uh, the competing demands of the job, um, it seemed very natural that the Pan-African Student Union was that leadership um, sort of were were those students that were definitely leaders and were when given the opportunity to step up and provide other students with the services that the center provides uh, really did a wonderful job in complementing the Pan-African Center. It gave me the opportunity to be an officer many different times, uh, be able to be planning and being just organizing and being part of a team. Financially helping me out with um, school-wise, I got a lot of aid from them, um, got help with the financial aid, a lot of different um, things as far as academically that I didn't know about the whole college experience that Pastor was able to help me, um, give me information on that. Uh, when I first came here, because it was really in the midst of the larger national student movement of African American students. And so it was, um, I hadn't been that long out of college myself, so it was, a, it was a movement that personally changed my life um, as a young person, and it was also uh, very significant in that it was changing the way in which college courses were being taught. It, was, it brought new majors to the college, um, it really was a time of, of really great change, and I wanted to be a part of that. See, that's preposterous, and that same tongue that's stopping us, he's blocking us. It's to see it continue to be uh, a concrete organization at Oxford. Um, I think that they do a lot for the Oxford community um, as a whole, as far as Oxford and the Minneapolis community. Well, I think PASU has a great future. Um, I think it has the ability now to help the college uh, move from just integrating itself uh, into actually changing itself. It's, it's not going anywhere. It's, it's, it's probably the best, you know, organization of this kind in the city and, you know, outside of, uh, you know, the Deep South where you got full black schools, colleges, you don't find this kind of community up in this, you know, neighbor. So it's got a strong, strong. As long as everybody's still dedicated and the officers were still recruiting and still getting students to be involved, then PASU is, PASU's future looks good. Students were the driving force for um, a network, really a social network on a college campus like Augsburg's um, is, is truly amazing. And to be able to look back now in 2009, those, these last 40 years have provided us with a, a wealth of knowledge and, a, and um, a great deal of a really great opportunity to grow um, as, a, as a student body, as a collective, and as members of the community at large. <laughs> Next slide, please. So um, these are deep roots. 1968 is happening in the world, right? 
um, black student movements uh, are, are happening. And that um, same sort of um, roots, right, back to Lutheran protests um, is, I think, so integrated and deep within um, Augsburg. Um, this idea of reformers, right? Um, um, so, um, doing the um, plight of th things were, that were happening at Augsburg um, in the last few years, and happening in the world with the um, with the horrific killings of um, blacks, um, Augsburg student and student body and Pasu revisited what we call one day in May, and um, it was labeled um, 6820, that was the um, cusp, right, of the next year with student and world protests, um, but also student protests at Augsburg related to the George Floyd um, killing uh, and just um, general um, ideas of this ideal of um, freedom. So the um, so the donning of student protests and demand at Augsburg, the picture um, is a picture of um, some of the um, things uh, uh, that um, the picture shows uh, a workshop uh, where students get, came together and was thinking about different kind of ideas and posters um, for the um, protests. So um, during the spring semester of 2020, members of the Augsburg community embarked on a journey to uplift stories of the one day in May. The 1960-20 uh, designation referenced the historical 1968 one day in May event and is ever um, relevant implications for 2020 and beyond. Um, um, this was a prelude to a student push in the demand that happened in 1968 that finally came to, to fruition in um, 2021, 20, uh, and that was the critical race and ethnic studies. Um, Cress was realized. So you can see um, sort of this um, um, strong sort of um, root of protest. Next slide, please. And so I think to sum it up, uh, what I learned from this and keep learning is that there are these old age, um, age old questions, right? So I believe that there's a history here at Augsburg um, that first reside in purpose, people and place. And the age old questions are what is true and good which is a search for identity through the trend, trend, uh, trend, um, tradition of serving a higher good, that's purpose. What's meaningful and worthy? What do you give your life to? A search for value to give life over to and fight the, for the fulfillment of what's good. That's the reformers that's throughout Augsburg history. It's people. And then what's next? A search for action and next steps, where to land. That's all in Augsburg history in terms of from Germany to Wisconsin to here, right, in Minneapolis. And so what we see here is this theme of purpose, people, and place. Next slide, please. So I believe that Augsburg saga, and we do have one, is dramatic, uh, uh, it's painful. Um, but it's also, as Katie said, and the librarian that we work with, it's, it's love. Right. So what binds us? I think a sense of tradition to serve a higher good that gives us identity. I can identify with you and you can identify with me through many things. But I think um, there's a um, pattern of um, uh, reforming, um, um, doing things that are good. Right. Uh, what also binds us an openness and value to reform, reforming or reformation, even fighting against the establishment. And that's this ideal of fulfillment. And the last thing, a saga, I think Augsburg, is the preservation of memory and action of an escape from error, abuse, and discrepancy. So this, the, uh, to sum up, I think our saga and what connects us is identity, fulfillment, and a destiny. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanted you to hear directly from Pasu uh, and myself because the question of who writes our history, um, by lifting up the voice of this one day in May, and then um, Pasu uh, and the continual things is, that are happening at Augsburg um, with students, I think that um, 
James Baldwin um, put it nicely. Um, who writes our history? History is not the past. It is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. James Baldwin, 20th century American writer. Thank you. Well, um, this is a time now when we can ask our questions or people can put some uh, questions up on the chat board. Um, again, Terrence, you did a beautiful job of connecting Luther's protest to try to get back to the truth. The question often is, what is the truth? What's really going on and what is the truth of of our current situation? And um, I, I think Luther really did put in place a, a way of addressing wrong, a, a way of addressing uh, the need for people because truth sets us free according to our tradition. And if and if we keep making up our own truth, we bind ourselves. So, um, where do you see this taking us uh, into the future? I mean, what are you know where what are some signs of fulfillment and destiny that you see coming out of our identity? Through this saga project and other research that um, colleagues and staff are doing, um, 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 we have a history of taking things on, right? Being the first, um, sometimes not related to material um, uh, accomplishment, uh, but fulfilling that which um, at the moment is the answer to a, a practical problem. So I think that um, um, the Saga Project and this particular research around the first just helps us identify and remind us um, um, how, as an organization, we have to be forward thinking. And to be forward thinking, we have to know our history in order to be informed. So I, I think there's a lot of implications, and we can look at how Augsburg have, um, has used history um, 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 to make good on promises and to serve the particular communities in which they, uh, um, they are physically, but also spiritually connected to. Yeah. Um, I really uh, connected with James Baldwin's quote on our history is present. It was Pope John Paul II um, some years ago during Vatican II and during one of his uh, 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 homilies said, history can't just be something that we read about and think about. It has to become an active function of remembering to pass on. And so he likened that to a sacrament saying, when we take the bread and the wine every Sunday for Christians that go to church, um, they're experiencing the remembering by incorporating that history in the bread and the wine. It's a way of of rooting ourselves. And um, uh, can you say a little bit more about that? How did that? Where did, what did Baldwin, I mean, how, what impact did he have after he said that, do you? Um, yeah, I think that, um, 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 so I think just like the saga project, yeah. um, Baldwin thought that, you know, so the saga of the conflict um, in terms of just uh, America related to um, um, proclaiming to be a land of um, um, freedom and equality, but mm -hmm. in real time doing just the opposite. And so he thought um, that 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 tension of reminding us of our history, even if our history is painful, that that is, um, is something that we have to be aware of. So history is present um, 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 related to this tension between sometimes what we um, hope and then what we do and how that has to be aligned. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much, Terrence, for being with us today and uh, um, share with us your own findings. Um, I think it's particularly significant as one who didn't grow up in the Lutheran church, but as a part of a Lutheran institution, how you're able to pull and maybe know our own history better than many of us have been lifelong Lutherans and Luther's direct correlation and impact with the kind of changes that we've seen most recently, particularly at Augsburg and how it's shaped its own future. So yes. thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody, uh, needs to know that uh, normally Terrence would stay on, but he's uh, we adjusted him to come to this session rather than another one. And so he has other things he has to jump into today. And so Terrence, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Well, now we turn to Katie. Um, and Katie, uh, we heard some of the stuff that you've done. I mean, you are cutting a new swath in our own self-understanding of how we move from uh, trying to get students to come up to our standard. I think you're really one who's saying we need to turn that around and transform that into how do we as an institution reach into the lives of our students and help prepare them and be part of their their path for for success. And um, but you obviously are part of this project too because you've been stimulated some by its history. As you said, you've you're already a second generation of <laughs> Augsburger, <laughs> and uh, it's shaped you in many, many ways, probably in your own worldview and viewpoint. But really, would like to hear from you now on on your work as well. Thanks, thanks, Jack. So, um, so I approached uh, kind of my research question in this project um, really from the place of you know in my work. Um, my work is really centered around, are we meeting our promise to students? Um, and at the moment, we're only graduating about half of the students who we admit and who start at Augsburg. And so kind of my role is focused on if we accept the premise that we've made a promise to students when we admit them, and that promise is that they're going to have access to the Augsburg education, which is about training the next generation of stewards of our democracy. Um, are we actually keeping our promise to students when too many students end up not graduating, not finding success on the campus? Um, and so my work really um, wrestles with sort of um, who Augsburg has been and what and who Augsburg needs to be moving forward in order to better serve our students. Um, and it feels to me, and it has for a little while, like we're kind of at this pivot point where, um, where we have this um, narrative history of being first, and we're first in many communities and in many different ways, um, and taking on work that other institutions don't take on. But if we're also not structured in a way that's actually working for our students, then are we fulfilling the promise that we've made? And so, just, you know, that's kind of the frame for my work on the campus. And so that's a little bit how I approached the project. Um, and so my kind of research question was really about um, this moment in time in 2022 at Augsburg, or it was 2021 when I, when I first uh, started this. Um, is this a moment where the institution really needs to find transformational change? Or is this a moment where we can kind of evolve and have a more natural not more natural, but a kind of evolutionary change, um, which is really maybe something that we've experienced over our history um, in the past. And so then kind of layering on top of that, this idea of being first and what that might mean and how in those moments of firstness, the institution has experienced change that might be either transformational or evolutionary and what those moments kind of tell us and what we can learn from them in terms of how we might consider moving forward now. So um, we can go to the uh, first slide, or the next slide in the slide deck. So this is a, a, a little bit of a picture of our um, new strategic plan. It's a, it's a little bit two years old now. Um, and it really, it lays out the vision and the call, I think, for what, what we feel like Augsburg needs to be. And that um, is, our vision is to be a new kind of urban student-centered university. Um, and that might seem like a really um, 
like blase kind of statement, right? Like, of course, we're going to be student centered. We're a university and we have students. So, so what else would we be? But I actually think that that vision and that call is really, really radical because when you really dig into higher education and, and universities, institutions of higher ed, so much of the structure of an institution is actually built around kind of perpetuating itself. And it's built around um, issues that actually don't touch students and are not student focused, um, issues of faculty work, staff work, um, you know, other, other things that actually don't touch students and actually don't have any implication for whether a student can be successful or not. And so for me, this call in our strategic plan to be kind of radically student-centered really is about naming the fact that everything we do has to be focused on whether or not we're meeting our promise to students. And if we're, if we're not clear on what we're doing and whether that's meeting our promise, then that thing that we're doing should be interrogated. Um, and so uh, we can move to the next slide. So that's, um, I share that just because that was kind of the um, lens through which I um, started this project and, and was kind of looking for, um, you know, kind of the research question and, and how to approach it. And, you know, Paul, Paul said, Katie, I want you to explore what it is to be first on the campus. Um, and I sort of thought, oh, gosh, well, like, what is it to be first? Um, you know, Terrence had a beautiful list of firsts, first Nobel Peace Prize winner, the first um, dean of students, the first person to be the advisor for the Pan -African, Pan African Center. Um, we also have a lot of firsts that happen every single day that we don't notice or name or, or live out deeply, each of us individually. 60% um, of our students are the first person in their family to attend college. That is a firstness that our students live every day that they are on our campus. And, and how we recognize that and name it has profound influence on their success and how we, how we support students and, and work with them. Um, we can go to the next slide here. So, you know, different ways to be first. You can be the first in a historical context. Um, you can be the first in an achievement. Um, you can be first and nobody knows it because it isn't sort of historically contextualized. And so, you know, there are firsts that we live out, each of us in our lives, and then there are firsts that the institution lives out. Um, and so as I was working through this project, all of that is a long-winded way to get to what my actual research project was, which was to, um, learn a little bit more about Gerda Mortensen, who um, came to the campus in 1923 and was hired um, as our first Dean of Women. Um, and the more I started to read about her, I, I did some reading. We have two published historical texts about Augsburg, um, From Fjord to Freeway by Carl Chislock in 1969, and then Hold Fast to What is Good by Phil Adamo in 2019. And so I started to, really look at those texts and look at the way that um, Gerda's history and story was told in those texts. And um, just some really fascinating things started to come up in how how her history was, was shared and written. So um, just a little bit about Gerda. Um, she is from Minnesota. Um, I think she went to Mankato State for her undergrad. Um, and then she went to Columbia and she has a master's degree from Columbia, which um, at that time in the um, um, uh, 1919 was really a big deal. And it's not celebrated anywhere that, that Gerda ended up getting a master's from Columbia, but that, I mean, that's really profound to have a woman who did that. So in 1921, Augsburg admitted five women on a kind of probational status. Um, they weren't fully admitted because Augsburg actually wasn't clear on whether they wanted to continue admitting women. And so they did it a little bit as on, on probation. Like, like these students are here for now and we'll see if they cause trouble and if they get too uppity. And, you know, if, if the girls can't behave, then maybe we won't move forward and admit more women. So in 1921, we had this group of five women admitted who were this sort of um, test group. And then in 1922, the institution decided to fully and properly start to admit women as part of the admissions process. 
Um, and then in 1923, um, they hired Gerda Mortensen to be the first dean of women. Um, and her uh, job title is really, um, her, her job was to help women integrate into the campus. Um, and there was no sort of template for how to do that. Um, her job was just to be here and to help essentially make sure that the, the women could be successful at Augsburg. Um, and so she was also um, a faculty and she was a faculty person in the history department. Her undergrad uh, degree was in history. And so she um, was both the Dean of Women and a faculty member in the history department. Um, and so there was no framework for how she was gonna do this work. And as you read our historical texts and start to kind of hear and, and see how her work was positioned, um, right away when she got here, um, it seems obvious that she was not accepted um, in, in a good way. Um, and that the quotes are um, that male colleagues at Augsburg were, quote, unaccustomed to leadership by women faculty members. Um, and until her arrival, Augsburg men had only seen women as faculty wives or as employees in the dining facilities. And so this is the, the um, era that she entered into. So come to campus with her own credentials, with her own kind of expertise, and then, you know, be first. And that's a kind of lonely place to be. And then be responsible for integrating women in this um, kind of environment, I would say, of some suspicion about what, what are women doing here? And, you know, are, if you're not, if you're going to have leadership as a female faculty member, then, then what is that exactly? And how, how is that going to, to work? Um, and so, you know, Gerda, I think, <laughs> in the texts really doesn't get credit for being the diplomat that she obviously must have been because she was at Augsburg for 40 years and we named a, a dormitory after her. And she is highly thought of and considered one of the important pillars of our, of our history. And so the diplomacy that she must have employed in order to make all of this work, um, I think is something that deserves maybe a little more interrogation. Um, so one of the things that Gerda decided she would do is that um, many students who came to Augsburg at that, in that era were from rural farm communities, rural um, Lutheran farm communities, and, and women as well as men. And so she decided that part of how women would be best integrated would be to um, teach etiquette, dress, and social behavior, um, essentially so that um, the women could seem a little more uh, middle class and, and sort of not cause trouble on the campus. They could be the least sort of offensive presence as possible so that they could get along and everybody could sort of get along together. Um, and this is this is addressed in the in the um, historical narrative. So in hold fast to what is good, um, this kind of dichotomy about having this very um, this woman with a lot of achievements who's being first. Um, and then the work that she actually has to do on the campus and how that work is named is really interesting. So um, for example, um, Gerda would give public speeches on the campus. Um, and when men, male administrators would give speeches, their speeches were recorded and put in the student newspaper, The Echo. Um, Gerda's speeches were not recorded and rarely featured in The Echo, um, implying that her commentary was somehow not of interest or important enough to be in The Echo. And so, so that is a moment on its own. And then as we go through this historical text, the author then talks about Gerda and, and sort of her decision that, that part of her work would be to um, essentially make women seem, you know, a little more middle class, a little more upper middle class. And so, um, you know, etiquette and behavior and dress. Um, and then the, the, his, the author of this history says, and I quote, one wonders whether these were the most pressing issues women faced in the 1930s. And so I think this is this is really interesting because we have an individual who is being first. She's living out that firstness in her own career, and she's helping other women also be first on the campus in their educational experience. And the author of this history of Augsburg can name that and can say, here's a way in which her firstness was challenged and not acknowledged by male colleagues. And then also this male author adds his own commentary to it 
about the choices that she made about how to exist in that space. And so I think that this, um, it, it really kind of sums up this dichotomy about what your experience of being first and then also how people around you are naming that and responding and reacting to it. Um, we can go to the next slide here. So, um, so a lot of this sort of came to light for me because luckily um, somebody interviewed Gerda um, in, when did they interview her? Um, in 1969, so actually the year that, that the first history was written from Fjord to Freeway. Um, and another female faculty member on the campus who had started in the, in the same year as Gerda, um, but in a different department, um, and they had become really close friends, and she sat down and they did this oral interview. And so we have three hours of transcripted interview tapes of Gerda actually talking about her own experiences. And so we can line up and we can and we can listen to how Gerda talked about her own experience. And then we can read the historical texts that Augsburg has had authored about itself. And we can start to piece together the role of authorship and, and the role and how people perceive experience. So um, just another few comments about Gerda. Um, I wouldn't have known any of this. I've, I've been in Augsburg for over a decade and had a family member who worked here um, for 25 years. So have a good history at Augsburg and I knew nothing about this. And Gerda is actually, by the time she retired um, in the 60s, she was nationally known. Um, and she had spent four years um, being a nationally known leader in the field of student affairs and student success. Um, she was the kind of author and, and, and thought author of the idea of having a dean of students. Um, she worked with other institutions in Minnesota to help develop those positions on their campuses. Um, and she also actually played a really significant role in bringing um, women with diverse backgrounds into the field. And so she, um, in the 1920s and 30s, when it was very unpopular to do so, and this field was very white, Gerda invited a number of black women into the field. And she sort of, um, I guess sponsor would be one way to kind of articulate, like she supported them and mentored them and, and said that these individuals are with me and I, I stand up for them. And, um, and so all of that, I mean, there's just like a, a courage to that, a kind of bravery to that um, firstness where she is living that out and she's also bringing others with her and doing that. Um, and then you read these texts, these sort of, um, you know, officially authorized Augsburg texts about Gerda's experiences. And the themes in the text about Gerda don't focus on any of that. Um, they focus on centering her as a woman and her experiences as a woman, not as an administrator, not as an intellectual, not as somebody with um, significant credentials. But they center her kind of femaleness and they center um, the reaction of the men around her. So in the pages of these texts devoted to her, more text is devoted to how men responded to her presence and what she did and said rather than what she actually did and said. Um, it's worth noting that both of the authors of our, of our texts are male, although I don't think that necessarily um, means that men can't write good things about female administrators, um, but that her experiences are centered as how the men around her kind of responded. Um, it also, both texts really in an astonishing ways, because they're 50 years apart from each other, um, they focus just on these like small things that she did. Like these etiquette classes must have really taken the campus by storm because two whole pages in both books um, devoted to etiquette and dress classes um, and zero pages and words devoted to her kind of national standing, her um, experiences of, of diversifying the field, her thought leadership around what student success and student affairs could be. Um, and so it's really, um, I'm really grateful that we have the transcripts of Gerda's interviews so that we can hear her own voice in that and her own description of her experience. Um, and so going to this project is really interesting because then it makes me think about our own students of today. And um, some of what I feel like I've read about Gerda actually feels like the things that I read about our own students today, where we 
um, maybe talk about things like, you know, students don't know how to address faculty or are students writing emails that are polite enough or um, are students too loud? Um, do students know um, how to do certain things like go to office hours and, and do this, that, and the other thing? And there's, there's an undercurrent of behavior and sort of using behavior as a way to um, not control, but to sort of say whether you fit in or not. Um, and I think that that is a thread that runs through Goethe's history where, you know, the interest of the authors is more in how Goethe behaved and how she taught the women to behave. Um, and I feel like that's something that we still, there's a thread of that that runs still through the campus today about what we expect of students. And so for my own work, as I think about, are we in this moment of transformation? And really, if half our students aren't graduating, we have to be different. There's something that we are doing or not doing that means that we're not reaching our students. And because of that, we're not fulfilling our promise to students. And I really, um, I think this idea of authorship and who gets to write the narrative of what the experience is has a, um, some really nuanced um, implications for that. Um, so I'll leave it there and happy to happy to answer questions and have more conversation. Oh. Well, thank you, Katie, for uh, this, this presentation and to draw out uh, the impact of of Gerda on on our on our university. Um, do, do you know anything about the people around her that supported her? I mean, someone that could stay at the table for forty years and still be. Um, I mean, this is so similar to the civil rights movement, where you're constantly mm -hmm. being judged by your behavior and how you don't fit in, mm -hmm. not about your content. Mm -hmm or your prophetic word, who do you have any sense of who sustained her? Because you, you can't do that all by yourself. So I wonder who the, the hidden supporters were that helped mm -hmm. shape who she is. Do you have any sense of that? That's such an interesting question, Jack. You know, in her interview with um, Lillian, Lillian, what's her name? Um, Marion, Marion Lindemann, excuse me, Marion Lindemann, who, who was a French faculty um, on the campus. So they, they sat down and they um, they talked for three hours with each other. So they had a lot to say to each other about kind of the last 30 years of their shared experience at Augsburg. Um, and, you know, I, and I listened to most of it and I, you know, it's a little coded. It's not, nobody ever directly says, oh, this was really hard and it's a good thing that we had each other because <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't have, yeah. right? It's not, it's not quite as direct as that, but there there is this sense of sort of um, that there was a group of women who kind of all supported and helped each other. Um, and then, you know, Marion asks very directly um, kind of the diplomacy question, like, like this was a big challenge. How did you kind of face that challenge? And, um, and um, Gerda gives just like the best kind of diplomat answer where she says, well, over time, this is almost a direct quote. I'm not going to get it quite right, but it's almost direct. Over time, I realized that when you just enter a space and you just listen, and then you go back and you think about what you heard, and then maybe you make a small change. And then next time you go in and you listen, and then maybe you make a small change. Um, and so I'm framing that as diplomacy. Um, and she she clearly had developed like a way of sort of moving things forward and um, you know, she ended up creating the, the Division of Student Affairs at Augsburg. She ended up getting a dorm built. Um, you know, she had big achievements both on and off the campus. Um, and, and she just has this very quiet way of saying, well, I did a lot of listening and then I made small changes at a time. Uh, so she kind of lived with the, uh, the adage, have a big vision and take small steps. And she was comfortable with that. So. Uh, a lot of us who want to see change want it to come too quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and by too quickly, I mean, we can force it on people, but it isn't that they really embrace it, they react to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. she had that sense. That's really fascinating. You said that she had no framework really for this role. I mean, there are no job descriptions for a woman dean probably at that point, because she was breaking mm -hmm. new ground. 
Um, what was it about her? I mean, was that part of what stimulated her? Was going into the unknown and um, creating kind of out of the void? Um, mm -hmm. Any sense of in her writings or anything of of how how she did her, her that kind of creative creating those creative alternatives? Mm -hmm. Um, that's such an interesting question. You know, her, as I as I um, read about her work and as I listen to her, I, I just had this profound sense of like, oh, this is an Augie talking. Because there, I think there are things that sort of bind Augsburg and Augies, and then many of them kind of rooted in a deep sense of Lutheranism and, and what it is to be Lutheran and, and how that um, intersects with being an Augie. And so very, very humble, um, very... Um, focus, not focused on herself. And so when she answers the questions on the transcript, she doesn't say, here's what I thought about it. She says um, something, you know, like the question might be something like, okay, how, you know, this was a lot of work. How did you, why were you fueled to do that? She doesn't say, I felt like this was something that I needed to do for me. She says, I looked at the world and this work needed to be done. And so I contributed my part to it. Um, and so it's that way of situating yourself and that way of contextualizing yourself in community and um, and just sort of quietly doing the work that needs to be done without sort of saying I'm doing it for myself. Uh, so there was a real deep sense of humility about her own mm -hmm. needing to have her own horn blown or mm -hmm. <laughs> be supported. She was much more interested in the outcome of her efforts. I got a question. What role does the quality of a person's long-term memory of past events play in interpreting mm. what is true history? Mm. That's such a good question. Um, you know, and I, I don't know how to answer that exactly. Um, what I what I can share is sort of the different texts that I looked at, and then. You know, we can listen to Gerda's own interview and and her perception of those things. And um, you know, as I as I listen to her, um, I hear her being careful with her words. And so I don't, you know, I, I want to take her words at face value and not sort of make assumptions about what she's implying or not implying, um, because I don't know. I can't I can't go and talk to her and say when you when you said this, did you really mean this other thing? And you just weren't saying it directly. Uh, um, and so, so I, th you know, I don't want to take, I don't want to take too many liberties and say, well, I know other people have this experience and here's what Gerda said. It could sort of fit together. And then it's very different than these off texts. Um, I think, you know, and I'm not a trained historian. Um, I'm a trained lawyer. So, um, so, you know, I, I want to be careful about implying too much and, and taking her words just really at face value. Yeah. So as you look at your own life, you know, you you were, I was going to let people know among other, the many degrees you have, one of them is in law. And um, what what is she doing for you as you uh, continue to do your work and, and cut, uh, you know, you, you've got people that are kind of nervous when you walk into a room because <laughs> you, <laughs> you reflect change. And mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. so what, what is, you know, how is her history a living reality for you in your work? And people need to know you are a lawyer. You have that law degree. You, mm -hmm. you have a deep sense about justice and equity in your life and in mm -hmm. your expression. Um, uh, perhaps you found a home in <laughs> Gerda, or uh, I don't know. So, what, can you mm -hmm. speak to that a little bit? What does that mean for you? Because all of us have important people in our lives that have shaped mm -hmm. our lives, and we often don't take it seriously. And here, you're really doing a deep dive. So, what's the yeah? Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, it, <sighs> It is. It was really fascinating because I I didn't know anything about her um, other than we had a, a dorm with her name on it, um, and it it just wasn't 
um, you know, there are elements of Augsburg's history that I sort of knew and had learned, but this wasn't one of them. Um, and, you know, as I was really digging into this, you're right, there were a lot of moments that sort of felt similar to my own work in terms of um, really breaking down barriers for students um, and, and doing that within a context where, you know, there's a significant group of people who think that what we've been doing is okay, and so we should keep doing that. And, and having a job that's sort of focused on well, maybe it isn't okay, and we need to do things a little bit differently. Um, and sort of how you how you create consensus, how you move forward with things. Um, you know, because I, you know, I I am was. I don't know if you ever stop being a lawyer, really. Um, you know, I come to my work too often. I think with a very kind of analytical. Well, here are the arguments, and here's the research, and here's the plan and here's what we should do. And, um, you know, so spending a lot of time with Gerda is really, and I have other moments like this, but one of those moments that for me is really a touchstone about, you know, you have to think about community, you have to think about relationship, you have to think about um, the pace at which you're going to move forward. Um, you know, I always wanna move a little more quickly. And, um, and so it's interesting to read about somebody who over the arc of 40 years was able to create really big change um, and sort of how she approached doing that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Katie. It's was fun to both hear your own journey a little bit and the impact that a person has. And I think you have inspired me to think about who were the people in my life that I probably took for granted. But if I would go back and do a little bit more of a deep dive, uh, those significant people have had an impact. And whether I live out of that in a way that really strengthens my capacity to address today's world or not, um, really depends on the living memory that, that I have. And for Augsburgs to do this at this point, when there's so much crisis going on, to try to create its collective memory. I mean, families are institutions, and so are organizations institutions, but we we live within the context of institutions and their history. So this has been great. Well, thank you. And uh, I wanna turn now um, to talk a little bit about what's coming up next, next week, uh, February 16th, uh, David Teedy, um, who's on the Board of Regents of President Emeritus of Luther Seminary and Paul Primenow, our president, are gonna be the keynote speakers and presenters next week. And here's what they have to say. Augsburg University is one of the only institutions of higher learning in the United States that helped to create a denomination, a fact that has had remarkable implication for Augsburg's culture and its faith commitments. This session will return to Augsburg's founding in 1869 and will trace the influence of the Haugian tradition out of Norway on the formation of the Lutheran Free Church in the 1890s through its existence as a separate denomination until 1963. You know, Augsburg University is unique in that it wasn't first authorized by the what would be the equivalent of the ELCA, but it was the church, it was the school that helped uh, foster congregations instead of the congregations as so many of the other universities, the congregations were the ones that called forth the university. Here, the university actually fostered a denomination. So it'll be interesting to hear what that history has to say about our own, uh, not only our own firsts, but the role that we've played um, prophetically um, in the way in which we were actually founded um, in this country. So that's next week, David Titi um, and Paul Primenau. So thank you again, Katie, and um, thank Terrence and Abstencia, he's not with us, <laughs> for also presenting. And for the rest of you, we're, and we're ending a little early by five minutes. Hope that's okay with everybody. And we look forward to seeing you all next week at the same time, uh, same station. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>